Well, good morning, everyone. There's a couple of new things going on today. You saw this stage, right? We already cheered for it. Praise God for that stage. That's so awesome that we have it. Uh, Did you notice? I don't know. uh, It's such a wide stage now that Carol was out of the lights over there on the keyboard. You might not have seen her even up there, but I think maybe we could probably move her in just for this week, and then we'll adjust the lights next week probably. But it's so awesome to have this stage. And like Lori was saying, to have something that doesn't squeak when we walk on it. Although... Are we used to hearing the words, let's pray from Pastor Guy, and then er, er, er. it's going to just be so strange. It's going to be really weird. And I guess the other new thing today is me. What am I doing up here? This is... <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, Pastor Guy is the speaker up at Angelus Crest for Man Camp this weekend, and Ab is up there with a bunch of our guys, too. So they're just going to have a blessed weekend. And then Dawson decided to go and help his friend at his wedding, be in his friend's wedding, and so they pulled me up off the bench, and so you're stuck with me today, all right? (laughs) We've been doing just this, this awesome series on the book of Acts called Unfinished Story, And I'm going to just continue right on where Guy left off last week. Uh, We're going to move actually two chapters ahead of where he was. We're going to be in chapter 5 this week. Um, And uh, he shared last week, remember Pastor Guy shared last week about uh, the fact that we, just like the apostles, were called to be witnesses of what God was doing with this new community of people. Um, And so we are witnesses... uh, of what God's doing in our own lives, just as the apostles were witnesses of what God's doing with that community. Um, that community is, is growing at this time uh, that we're going to be reading. It's showing the power and the evidence of God with miracles and fellowship and generosity. But uh, first, before we read our text today, I just want you to kind of think about something for a minute. Just think about maybe a trial that you've gone through in your life, a time of trial. And maybe even you're going through one right now. Um, But when it comes to these trials, Jesus even gave us a bit of a warning, uh, yet it's also an encouragement that's recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 33. And, And Jesus said this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And in that verse, Jesus didn't say you might have trouble. Or you're only going to have trouble when you're outside of God's will. He was very clear. He said, you will have trouble. Jesus is clear on that point, that we will all go through times of trouble. And if you're going through one of those troubling times right now, or like the verse says, we may be doing that in the future, we have good news for you. The apostles in our text today, they went through a couple of trials, actually two trials in two days, in a two-day span. And, And we can learn a lot from what what they did, the God-honoring way that they dealt with these trials. So that's going to be in Acts chapter 5, when we're going to start in verse 17. But uh, while you turn there, if you haven't yet, um, let me set the stage a bit. The word was getting around town about the disciples of Jesus, who we now refer to as the apostles, right? Because they're continuing that work that Jesus discipled them in. People were beginning to flock to them. The Spirit of God was so active that People in the streets were hoping that healings would happen just by the shadow of Peter crossing someone's body, it says in verse 15. This created a great amount of jealousy from the same religious leaders who orchestrated Christ's death. And we'll pick it up in verse 17, and then we're going to go all the way through verse 33, and that's, that's our text for today. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, And filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out. And he said, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and they began to teach. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported, we found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, 
they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set, before, set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet, here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. So just as we saw previously in Acts, the beginning of, of today's passage that, that I was just reading shows more conflict between the word of God spreading and the religious authorities in Jerusalem. We've got the council that's already told them to stop, and now they're serious enough in their accusations that they're, they're already arresting the apostles. They're putting them in jail, leaving them there to the next day to stew, maybe, maybe hoping to soften them up, help them to cooperate a bit more. But as, you, as we read, the, the apostles promptly escaped from their cell with the help of an angel of the Lord. But the angel was sure to give them a commission, or at least a reminder of what they were to be about. In verse 20, the angel told the apostles to preach the whole life of Christ and his teachings, reminding of the full mission, the whole message about this life. So this right here is the first lesson that we can learn from the apostles when we are going to be going through trials in our life. It's to trust in the goodness of God. Trust in the goodness of God. We do not learn the character of God by looking around us at the suffering of people. We learn God's character with accuracy by studying the life and the ministry of Jesus. If you belong to God's family today through having placed your trust and faith in Jesus as your Savior, I urge you, get to know the Lord Jesus well. Learn of him. Hang out with him in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then read the Bible's letters to the various churches, the epistles, to learn how to successfully walk out your faith in Jesus Christ. Pastor Guy really focused on this during week two of our series when he was talking about how Jesus changes lives. Last year during uh, uh, the Dodger season, my wife and I went to uh, a game, and as kind of a treat, we got to go just the two of us this time. We didn't bring our whole family, and we were lucky enough to have uh, an old enough daughter to babysit our two boys. And so they were at home. We got to enjoy a Dodger game, but while they were at home, they were, of course, up to something. And uh, I don't know if you guys uh, have this or not. We have a, a Nintendo Switch, and with a Nintendo Switch, they come with these, like, teeny little controllers, right? But they have motion sensors in them. So when you move your hands around, different things can happen. You can play tennis, you can play baseball, you can play games like that, bowling uh, with these controllers. But the one thing that you have to do, and the one rule that we have in place in our house is, it's got a little string attached to it. You put that rope around your wrist, tighten it up, play the game, do what you want. Because what does that do? Keeps things safe around the house. Our youngest son, Chase, forgot about that rule. Was playing, uh, I don't even know what game it was, bowling, okay? <laughs> Thanks, Chase. <laughs> and accidentally let go of the controller, and it shot into the upper right corner of our television. I got a picture. It's not a very good picture from my phone, but look at the upper right. <laughs> it just decimated the corner of that <laughs> TV. Uh, and uh, what, what's funny is, though, when the TV was off as we came home, you couldn't see that. There's maybe a tiny little crack that we couldn't see with our own eyes. And get this, this is what our, our children were doing when we got home from the Dodger game. They were all sitting down on the couch in the living room reading books quietly. <laughs> yep. All it took was one look for my wife and I to give each other, and we knew something was up, because that is not our kids. <laughs> And so as soon as we asked what was going on, some blaming and scapegoating happened. Um, 
Chase did eventually kind of go to tears, uh, maybe for fear about what might happen to him, but I think more so of just truly being sorry for what happened. Um, and at that point, we had a couple of ways we could have handled it. First of all, I had to contain my excitement that I was getting a new TV out of this deal. <laughs> <laughs> and then secondly, we could have laid into him, right? Especially, uh, you know, we could have laid into Chase, but we knew it was an accident. And we knew that he was full of remorse. We knew that he felt horrible about it. So after, after letting him sweat it out a bit while getting ready for bed, we all sat down and we were able to kind of turn that situation into a bit of a teaching moment on, you know, first of all, understanding that we have rules in place for a reason, but even more importantly, on forgiveness. Um, as parents, we want our kids to have those godly values instilled in them. But as our heavenly father, how much better is our great God to us. He is such a good God. He's such a forgiving God, a God who through the blood of Jesus forgives us of our sins. Ephesians 1, 7 says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. So when we are going through a trial in our lives, remember to trust in that goodness. So as we get back to our text, the Jewish council now is, is ready to make the apostles sweat it out. So they go to get him from jail, but what do they find? A mystery, a locked door. Jailers unaware of anything that happened and empty cells. So they start trying to find them until someone looks out the window, so to say, so to speak, and this, this unnamed person in the verses has to tell them, hey, you remember those guys that we locked up they, uh, and, and those guys that vanished? They're back out there at the temple court and they're doing exactly what they got arrested for. So for the second time in two days, the authorities have to bring them in, and the high priest tells them, we strictly told you not to preach the name of Jesus, and that's exactly what you're doing again. And this was Peter's response in verse 29. I love this response. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. So this brings us to the second lesson that we can learn from the apostles. Stay obedient to God. Stay obedient to God. This is uh, one of those things that's easy to say, but difficult to do when going through a time of trial. The apostles were broken out of jail late at night, right? It says, yet yeah, they started teaching at daybreak. They didn't waste any time. Like the Blues Brothers, they were on a mission from God. <laughs> they were going to be all about that mission. John has, a good, John has some good wisdom for us in, in the book of uh, 1 John, uh, chapter 2, verses 5 and 6 about this. He says, but if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. For this, and then also in 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, he says, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. It's so sad that many people usually turn away from God when things get difficult. It's because they try to do things in their own, on their own power, in their own way. And if we want to get through trials in our life, we've got to stay obedient to God. Experiencing pain through trials and persevering through them is just such a great way to truly experience God's joy and peace by trusting him at a deeper level. And I love that it's Peter that says this part, we must obey God rather than men. This is the same Peter that's had a lot of ups and downs, right? While being a disciple of Christ. The same Peter that when Jesus asked earlier, who do you say I am? He asked to all the disciples. Peter was the first to blurt out, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, which prompted Jesus to praise Peter, calling him the rock, which that name means. And on this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell, hell shall never prevail against it. But it's also the same Peter that when he found out Jesus was going to have to die, Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And at that point, Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me, for you're not setting your minds on the things of God, but the things of man. This is also the same Peter that took a leap of faith, right? To step out onto that choppy water and walk on water towards Peter, um, towards Jesus. And it's also the same Peter that not, not long before these verses that we're reading right here in Acts, denied Jesus, denied knowing Jesus even three times. But what is different in Peter's life now? What's the difference? 
at the point in time that we're reading in Acts? Well, for one thing, Jesus already did die on the cross, was in the tomb for three days and rose from the dead. So Peter got to see him after the resurrection and, and still learn from him for 40 days. But secondly, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he gave Peter and the other disciples the gift of the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that Peter preached about a couple of chapters earlier in Acts saying, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk a little bit more about the Holy Spirit in a bit, but in our life as a Christ follower, we can't just do the parts we like. We don't just do the easy and the convenient stuff, but we've got to commit to the whole calling of walking as Christ did, of being those sent ones, the witnesses, like Guy was reminding us last week. Another thing in that verse 29 is that it reminds us that we don't need to be people pleasers. We must obey God rather than men. Speaking personally here, I just see in my own life a, a dangerous tendency and a temptation to be a people pleaser. I see my own pride as such a sinful tendency to, to let things like that motivate me. So sentences like this go on in my head a lot. How will this affect the way others perceive me? How is this going to affect the way others think of me? What will others think about this or that? Have you ever found yourself asking questions like that? How much better would it be, though, if I was driven, if we were driven, like our every single thought, our desire, and our action was driven by what will God think of this? What's going to most please him? What's most obedient to his word? I want that to be the driving motivation of my life, your life, because this is what matters. Our motivation ought to be to please and obey God rather than men. People's perception, people's praise, even people's applause, it's fleeting. It doesn't last. It's not what matters. What matters ultimately is what God says and what he has said in his word, and obeying it. We must obey God rather than men. In the context here in Acts 5.29, in the middle of persecution for these apostles, that was costly, very costly for them as they were experiencing imprisonment. But in this case, they even said, our goal is not to please the government even, our goal is to please God. May this motivation drive us today at everything we do. So when we're going through times of trial in our lives, we can learn from the apostles to trust in the goodness of God, to stay obedient to God, and number three, we can learn to proclaim Christ above all. Peter wasn't interested either then or in the earlier arrest to even give any kind of defense or justification, but instead he took it more of his, as a chance to witness of Christ who was calling them to do this. We sang that today in one of our worship songs, right? I've witnessed it. I've witnessed your faithfulness. I've seen you breathe life within, so I'll pour out my praise again. You're worthy, God, worthy of all of it. I had to write that down because I never remember lyrics at all. <laughs> how would the activities that we set our minds to, the activities we set our minds to be different if we were less interested in justifying who we are, proving that we're right, and winning, and, but instead we focus on witnessing for the God that has called us to be his children. The chief priest is accusing them of spreading tales of that man, they said, referring to Jesus obliquely on purpose, right? Because they want to remove connections, distance themselves from Jesus and their own culpability. After Peter, though, with the apostles, responds by saying, we must obey God rather than men, once again they proceed to declare the same gospel, good news, message that we have heard several times before in their preaching in Acts. What they say to the Jewish leaders is practically a condensed version of the gospel in three short verses. It's Acts chapter 5, 30 through 32, that part of it, 30 through 32. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Notice that they're completely uninterested in defending themselves. They simply want to proclaim Christ. The apostles' response references each member of the Trinity, 
Verse 30, God the Father raised God the Son, who was crucified by the Jews. Verse 31, ex exalted him at the right hand as leader and savior. And verse 32, God the Spirit is witness and has been given to those who obey. The basic parts of the gospel, the components of the gospel are all right there. The crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus, and the role of the apostles as witnesses. This scripture also reminds us of the importance of the Holy Spirit, that there's a connection between receiving the Holy Spirit and preaching the Word of God. In Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, Jesus quoted a powerful prophetic scripture from Isaiah, basically telling the people of his hometown, Nazareth, that he was the fulfillment of the prophecy. This is a good example of the connection between receiving the Holy Spirit and then preaching. Luke 4, 18 and 19 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Also in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, it says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Also, if you've been going through the, the promise cards, uh, these promise cards that we've had, this past week's promise was specifically about uh, the Holy Spirit, um, that connection also, and so of God giving us the Holy Spirit. It's Luke chapter 11, verses 9 through 13. It says, And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead, a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, would give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is a promise that Jesus gave while teaching his disciples, and it's a promise for each and every one of us as Christ followers. So going back to our text, this gospel message that Peter gives, it begins and it ends with the word obey. Obedience to God frames that gospel proclamation. It also follows a thread that we've seen throughout chapter 5 of Acts. Uh, the beginning of this chapter that we're on, it begins uh, with uh, Ananias and Sapphira. And I was uh, talking to, to Matt earlier this week, and uh, actually probably last week, and uh, telling him that I couldn't get a song out of my head that we used to sing in kids' church here, and then when we led kids' church that we'd lead. So we sang it so many times that we had it memorized. So I'm going to attempt to sing this song to you to recap Ananias and Sapphira for you, okay? You ready? It goes like this, but I'll do it kind of slow so you can understand the words, but this is one of those songs in kids' church where you start slow, then the next time you do it faster and faster and faster. Basically, it goes like this. Ananias and Sapphira got together to conspire a plot to cheat the church and get ahead. They knew God's power but did not fear it, tried to cheat the Holy Spirit. Peter prophesied it, and they both dropped dead. God loves a cheerful giver. Give him all you've got. He loves to see us laughing when we're in an awful spot. So when the odds are up against you and you cannot do a thing, praise God. To praise him is a joyous thing. There it is. <laughs> now, that, now that I actually understand this story more, it's pretty, pretty crazy that as kids we were talking about God killing two people and just saying, drop dead, right? <laughs> Having fun about it. <laughs> But in case you didn't get it through the song, the apostles um, and many of the new converts at the time, they were selling their land and their possessions, and they'd pool all that money together to have larger resources to further the kingdom of God. So that's how chapter 4 ends in Acts. And at the start of chapter 5, the, the husband and wife, Ananias and Sapphira, they sold their land and their possessions, and they gave their money to the group, but they kept some for themselves. They didn't give it all. They, they claimed that it was the total sum of everything, but they kept some for themselves. Um, and because of their disobedience, they both dropped dead. Huh, okay? 
Ananias and Sapphira were obedient or disobedient. And in our text today, the Jewish leaders uh, were reminded the Jewish leaders have been disobedient to God and they're dealing with the apostles. And now, in contrast, we see that the apostles, they're still obeying even in the face of this increasing hostility. Where did their boldness come from? They were filled with the Holy Spirit. You could say these apostles were obsessed with Christ. They could think of doing nothing else. They lived out the words that Paul wrote to the Philippian church. For them, to live was Christ and to die is gain. What about you? Are you willing to serve Jesus no matter the cost? Peter's example teaches us that we can face any trial with boldness if we proclaim Christ above all because we've been given that gift of the Holy Spirit. So just uh, in conclusion, I just want to remind you that in times of trial, which Jesus is clear, right, that we will have times of trial in this broken world, we can learn from the apostles in Act 5 to trust in the goodness of God, stay obedient to God, and proclaim Christ above all. Once again, all these things, they're easy to say, not so easy to do, especially when in the middle of a storm. So if you are going through a trial right now in your life, know that God is going through it with you. He's never going to leave you. He'll never forsake you. And we're going to be singing a song in a minute here. And, and if you would like some prayer or uh, just prayer for something you might be going through right now, there's going to be some people over here under the cross. Head over to the cross and they'd be willing to pray with you. If you're, um, if you're online and, and you'd like prayer, just, just uh, mention it in the chat and, and they would love to pray for you as well. Let's pray right now. Father God, we thank you so much for your goodness, for how good you are to us. And God, we just thank you for the reminder that as long as we stay obedient to you, Father, that you will always get us through every situation. There are, in, in a room this size, we know there are people that are going through trials right now, and so I lift them up to you right now, Father. I pray that they realize that you are there with them. They realize that your love is more than enough for them. And God, I pray that they feel supported by you, loved by you, Father, and that we as a church family can rally around them as well. You're so good to us and so worthy of our praise today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.